welcome our first guest, Stefan Beetke, aka Paul. Hello. So, how are you today? I'm good, thank you. So, the beginning is quite interesting because um, I understand that um, your early recordings started off from, uh, by this Waldorf four-pole filter that you were given, and that was the kind of blueprint for a lot of your early recordings. How did that come about? The story was that I got it in 1996, mm -hmm. I think, from a friend of mine, Thomas Freeman, and it broke, uh, it fell down, and um, it was supposed to be just a normal instrument filter that every synthesizer has built in, or nowadays software has built in, whatever cutoff, resonancy, some envelopes, and that was it. And I had it connected to my mixing board, and um, while I was working on music, I accidentally unmuted these two tracks where it was connected to. Was it to a bus or was it to...? It was a, a channel. Okay. It was connected to a channel on the mixing board. And when I, dis when I unmuted this channel, I heard these little hisses and noises and glitches that it was producing by itself without doing anything, actually. And I thought, like, this could actually replace the drum machine. Okay. So I took it for real and just said, okay, this is from now on my random drum machine. And the sounds that came from this wonderful mistake, did you have to process these sounds or did you use them as was? I mean, on, on the Blue album, I really used them as they came out of the machine. Okay, this was your, your debut album, right? Yeah, yeah. that was mm -hmm. the debut. And under the name Paul, it was the debut mm -hmm. album. Okay. So um, for that, I used it un manipulated. I just EQ'd it a bit because it was going down to the really sub bass area, like 30 hertz, 40 hertz or something, and up to the very top 20 kilohertz. So you had the full frequency range going on randomly. If I didn't like the beat that it was playing, I just turned it off and turned it on again and it did something new. It was, was producing it the, the audio. It was doing the audio by self itself. Self-oscillating. Self-oscillating. Yeah, okay. mm -hmm. And I just EQ'd it a tiny bit and put a compression on it, uh -huh. just to control it a tiny bit. But you turn it on and it plays and you don't like it and you can't, you can't change the beat that is, it is doing. You, you have to turn it off and turn it on again and then it plays a different beat. And the only, the only thing that I could change was the tempo. Okay. Because it was, I, I think the LFO was still working inside, or is still working inside. So that, that was w how, how the first album was born, actually. Has it got a name? Uh, yeah, I call him Paul. Okay. <laughs> it's the real one. <laughs> he's only making music. I'm his voice. Like it. And he's not around in the audience or anything? No. No? no? Okay. No. He's, he's shy. <laughs> But very expressive. Uh, very, very expressive and very bass heavy. Yeah. Indeed. So tell us a little bit about your equipment at that time. So you had, you talked about having a, an analog mixer. Obviously you had this four pole, you had a compressor. So I take it, your setup then, which was like the late nineties, right? Was mostly analog gear. I mean, that is where I came from actually. I grew up in the eighties, so pretty long time ago. I'm used to vintage gear like MOOC synthesizers, profits, um, Cork MS-20, Space Echoes, and whatever, analog mixing boards and tape machines. This is still the way how I make music until nowadays, actually. There were some instruments added to the analog world, digital gear that is now available, like computers or digital plugins or whatever. I'm, I'm partly sequencing it, actually, mm -hmm. um, but very often, for example, the bass lines, I very often really play by hand on my mini MOOC. Mm -hmm. and record it real time, because I like when it's not really quantized and stiff. I, I like when it's really played. Even though I record it into a software, uh, different softwares existing, uh, very often I record it into Ableton Live because that brings me to the position that I can play it in a live situation as well. But it's all made analog in the studio first hand and very often played. Um, second album was Red, right? S similar kind of vibe? I manipulated the filter a bit more. I recorded it into a sampler and chopped it up a bit to have a little bit more of control uh, what it is actually doing. So I was trying to kind of um, integrate it a little bit more to my bass playing. So the red one was definitely more dub orientated than the blue one. You're a big fan of dub music per se. My favorite time is between the early 60s and mid 70s actually. I'm not that much into diggy dub later on and I'm not really into earlier thing before 63, 64. 
Okay, why okay. that segment in time? I'm not trying to become a Jamaican dub musician or whatever. I'm not trying to copy reggae or dub. I'm just taking elements out of it. And I think in this time period, it was really interesting how they, how they EQ'd their bass lines. I'm, I'm really fascinated by bass sound. And how they combined it with space that they created with all the, all the gear that they were using. And I think one of the reasons why it became more interesting was the space echoes were designed in the end of 60s, early 70s, and a lot of little effect paddles came across, actually. Before that, it was all made in a slightly different way. Okay. And at this point, um, after, I guess, your, this trilogy, you set up your own label, That's the Escape? Is that when Escape kind of came around about that time? We found Escape uh, when the Red One came out in 99, mm -hmm. yeah. Okay. And what was the reason for setting up your own label as opposed to, you know, sharing the love? Basically, it was pretty easy. I was traveling a lot and I, I met a lot of really interesting producers and composers in the world. And the first guy I was really impressed by was Kit Clayton. He used to work at Cycling 74, um, well known for Max MSP. He threw a party in San Francisco where I was playing and um, I really loved his music. And he didn't have a platform in Europe. And I said, like, I, I have all these connections to the distribution people that distribute my records on, on the label that I was on. And I said, like, why don't I open up a, a label and give other producers that I really like a platform? Mm -hmm. And so we started with Kit Clayton, and then I met Ben Friedman again, who I was knowing before, because we lived together in Cologne, who we haven't seen for a long time. And I met him again here in Berlin, and he said, like, I have this Bernd Friedman at the Nuda Players album, and nobody wants to release it. And I gave it a listen, I said, I fuck, why doesn't nobody want to put it out? It's fantastic. So we put it out. And then it was kind of like a chain reaction. Suddenly I met Jan Jelinek, and Jan Jelinek said, OK, I have the, the Farben stuff on a, on a club uh, label in Frankfurt, and I have these other things that nobody wants. And I said, OK, why give it to me? I put it out. So that was a natural progression based on the idea to give artists a platform. Okay. That was the reason why we founded it, actually. So in terms of, I mean, you say we, this was um, Barbara. Barbara yeah. and me. Okay. Yeah. And that includes yourself, so Labor Boss. Yeah, Labor Boss, uh, what, what else did I do? I, 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 I'm, I'm a mastering engineer for yes, vinyl, I was gonna actually. Go into that. If you want to become a mastering engineer, first you have to learn how to listen. So I was trained in that. And at the same time, I'm running a studio myself since 84. Uh, so learning by doing, and then the vinyl cutting process, I really learned here at Duplets and Mastering. Okay. The risk that you take if you're a mastering engineer and producer is you clean up your sound too much and it ends up being sound design and not music anymore. So as a producer, you have to focus on being a musician, a producer. You have to focus on the idea and find a way how to communicate this basic idea. And it doesn't matter if the bass is too to be too loud or the hi-hat is a little bit too sharp or aggressive. That is dealt by the mastering engineer at the very end of the process. In my case, and this is really a pain in the ass, and I would say my last album, Steingarten, was a little bit in this trap, actually. After five years, I can say that. Um, it was too much on the sound design side and not enough on the musical side. And I, I, when I listen now to original recordings before I started treating the sound, um, I like the original versions now much better than the things that I have on, 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 on the CD now. And do you have an idea, I mean, looking back, can you see why you took that sound design route for this? Because I have this, I have this double, double thinking in my head. I start as a normal producer in the studio, and then when it comes down that I, I like the composition, and I would like to, turn, to, to record it uh, to tape or a CD or whatever, then I start tweaking the sounds. And I do that endlessly, honestly. If I master my own stuff, it takes three months or something for one track. Okay. So that's the reason why five years after it says, no, I'm So what does your set setup look like? There's one room which is the synthesizer room and the, the, the main mixing room, actually, with a lot of analog gear and old Studer mixing board and speakers and all that. And then there's a cutting lathe in front of that room. You've got a cutting lathe in your house? Yeah. You've got a cutting lathe in your house? Yeah. You've got a cutting lathe in your house? Yeah. You've got a cutting lathe in the <laughs> <laughs> who, who knows what cutting lathe is? Who doesn't, sorry? Who doesn't? You're not just sitting there like it's, like it's like nothing. He's got, you know, he's got, you know. 
some flowers. He's got a cutting lathe in his house. So you can just go from idea to duct plate while you're making a cup of tea. That is what I basically do every day. <laughs> so what's the advantage of having a cutting lathe in your house? There are two, actually. The first one is whenever I do a track in my studio, it's connected to the cutting lathe. I can give it a test cut and see how it will sound on vinyl. And the other thing is, it pays my bills. Because oh. I'm still running a mastering studio. I'm going to take it back a little bit. You know, kind of about 2003, you kind of take, took a, a kind of more hip-hop route in terms of productions. Um, what, what was the reason, reasoning behind that? I was playing in a hip-hop band from 89 till 92 or something like that. And it, it got stuck in my head, the way how they produce beats and all that. And what is the way they produce beats? Um, in an MPC, really hands-on, very quick with samples and um, played and very funky, faster than all the productions that I, that I did before. I mean, I was working without any beats before. I mean, the, my little Paul, he was, he was doing the beats, but it was not bass, drum, snare, hi -hat. It's more like rhythm, rhythm element. It was yeah. a rhythm element and not a beat. I had the idea, if, if I really fulfill a record that is based on a hip-hop idea, I will finally get rid of this permanently idea of make a hip-hop track that was in my head. You know, you have an idea and it, it will stick in your head as long as you write it down. When you've written it down, it's gone. Mm -hmm. Then it's fulfilled, it's made, and it's formulated, and then it makes sense that it is existing. And I just decided, without, without thinking about if it might be a good idea or a bad idea, I just said, like, I would like to fulfill that idea that is in my head since ages. Okay. That was the reason. And I'm pretty happy with, it, with this record. The only, the only problem is that I didn't take enough time to rethink it before I release it. I would have done some tracks differently nowadays, but the basic idea is still something that I can stand for. I'm having a new toy now. Um, I got this nice little drum machine last summer, actually, from a friend of mine. Which who, one's that then? Uh, it's a Hona CR76. But it's not in the original condition anymore, of course not. <laughs> did you, did you did yeah, do we, a poll? We, we took it apart, actually. Mm -hmm. okay. So we didn't throw it against the wall, but we took it apart. And a, a friend of mine, Holger Zapf, is a really talented, um, creative person when it comes down to, to, to develop new instruments. He's not doing it for professional reasons. He's, he's doing it for his own musical ideas. And um, he took it apart and built it in, in, into a new case with a step sequencer involved. And um, this machine has a very, very unique timing inside, which I, which, which I use to control Ableton in my computer. Um, it has a clock out and I have a little interface in between. So the timing of this machine is controlling Ableton in my studio, so Ableton is the slave of this rhythm box. And that brings me to the position that I can program with this rhythm box special beats, which are very unique because it has a specific sound. And at the same time, Ableton is following this weird timing that it has. And that brought me to the idea to start this series Waldgeschichten in fall last year. So the first two 12 inches are out, alre uh, out already, and the next one is coming in uh, eight weeks, okay. mm -hmm. and followed by a CD end of the year. Okay. So. so in terms of this uh, drum machine, is, is it, obviously it's entirely analog, yeah. and the tone generators are? Analog. Yeah, all analog. All analog. It's um, old oscillators, and he modified it in a way that you have resonancy on, on every single instrument. So it basically, it it starts feedbacking when you turn the knob too far up. Mm -hmm. And that gives a very unique tone between every, instru every single instrument, because it, it's a summing line, actually. That means the bass drum, snare, high toms, claps, whatever is in there is, has only one output. So it comes out on the very end. And when you crank up the bass drum, it stops everything that is after that. So it's just louder than all the other instruments. Or if you crank up the, the hi-hat, it stops everything that was before the hi-hat. Mm -hmm. So, and if you find the right balance between these things, you create really, really interesting sounds with this machine. 
But even more interesting than these sounds is the timing of this machine. If you control with that one the computer, then it becomes really interesting. And in terms of capturing, you, you use Ableton to capture. Yeah. Um, so once the sounds are captured in Ableton, what kind of processing? I create the sound in, 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 in the rhythm box or in a synthesizer, and I record it in Ableton as a kind of, first of all, as a kind of like a sample player, you could say. Um, and then I, I decide what I would like to take out in every clip in Ableton that might be, I, I record long parts. I, I'm not recording one bar. I re really record about a minute or something. I'm playing around with it, and then I chop things up that I would like to work with. Mm -hmm. And these are mainly looped for the live situation, which is part of my production as well. I always think about how can I transform the recording onto stage. After being on stage, I think about how can I bring this energy back onto the records. So it's, it's, a, it's a back and forth. It's not a separating Multi-dimensional kind yeah. of production. Sure, okay. So what kind of things you have to think about you know, when you're recording these passes um, and you're creating these clips? What thinking, what's the difference between thinking about a clip for in a live context as opposed to a production context? In the production, I don't ca take care of the sound at this point because you can still modify it in Ableton afterwards. In a live situation, I try to have the sound as good as possible in the recording before I go on stage, and I have to have everything leveled beforehand. In a live situation, I don't want to concentrate too much on um, how can I change the sound now, or how can I do this or that. I would like to concentrate on how can I play the software as an instrument. So I don't want to think about the, 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 the logistical part in it, I, I would like to think about the artistic part in it. So everything needs to be perfect in this machine, like a well-tuned guitar. Mm -hmm. And that, if it's well-tuned, then you can play it, because you know everything will fit together. Mm -hmm. if, it, if, it's, if it's not well-tuned, it will bring you weird surprises during the live show. Okay. And do you enjoy, I take it you enjoy playing live? I love playing live, yeah. Apart from getting out of the studio? Yeah. What drives your live performance? I, I have a setup in Ableton, and I have 12 channels that are coming out of Ableton. And these go into an analog mixing board, and from there into external effects. And I'm using Ableton effects. And I'm sending, basically, everything is modular on stage. I can send every single channel out of Ableton into whatever effect is on stage or I can send every effect back into Ableton. So um, I can really design the, the feedback curve or whatever. Mm -hmm. And that keeps me interested in the live performance because it is a very flexible tool that I have. It's, it's, like, it's, it's like a band without a band. Mm -hmm. Because I have all these small things and they are corresponding with the with the software, and the software is corresponding with with the with the little guitar pedals that I'm running, and that keeps me busy on stage. And the second thing, of course, is the reaction. If if I do a good job, the reaction of the audience can be good, or hopefully it's good, <laughs> and that drives me as well. I mean, and the more they reflect and the more they react on things the more heavy I can go into distortion or delays, and I dub it more, and the, the more comfortable I feel on stage, the more I do. Mm -hmm. And that's a corresponding thing between the audience and me and the instruments that I'm playing, because it's, it's all in one circle. Well, kind of a really great call and response situation. Yeah. And um, a lot, you do your live work as you're on your, by, by yourself, but also you work with other musicians. I used no. to have a band. Yeah. Okay. But that's mm -hmm. over. That's over. Yeah. And the reason for it being over, is that because I was then, in time, not interested in that anymore? Or is it something else? I make the decision, musically, does this track can stay in the computer or how I produced it? Or does it need a band to, be, to sound even better? And that is a key, a key part. You, you, you should always decide um, what fits the music or the composition that you make. Um, when it comes down, if you have to make a decision, how you have to perform it. So it's it, not everything in a computer is good. Not everything in a band is good. Not everything played by a trombone player is good. Sometimes it's better to have the same line in a mini-move played or whatever. So you have, you have to find the right form 
for the right piece of music. So what do you think is the future of digital music? Will it still be combined with analog stuff or not? The technology we have nowadays is not a replacement. It is an addition. But there is no need to use analog gear. There is no need to use digital gear. You have to make the decision while you compose the track if that is better or that is better. The question is more find the right way that helps you to design the right sound for your idea. How important is it for young producers to have kind of constraints and limitations on the ideas that they can execute on. So it seems to me like this, the fact that this filter broke kind of put you in a certain special space where you had to work in this space. Does that make sense? Yeah, totally. Uh, that, that's basically one of the other key, key questions and answers in, in a producer's life, I guess. Listen to whatever you do and listen to the mistakes that are happening. And if you have a slight, small mistake, doesn't matter what it is, listen to it, and when this inspires you, then take this limitation and concentrate on that and pull it as far as possible. Make the biggest thing out of it. This is the risk that we have nowadays. You have all the possibilities. You have millions of plugins, you have millions of software, you have millions of this and that. Concentrate on the idea and what's needed to create this idea and make it hearable. That's the thing. If I would not have had the four-pole filter, I, w I would be here, possibly. I did records before that. But I think I would not have had this really interesting time with one, two, three, and all the experiences afterwards. But I concentrated on this crackles. I didn't lose my concentration on different things. I was really focused on exactly that machine for six years and I pulled everything out of it. And that's the thing, if you use Ableton Live, there's, there's millions of possibilities in there. The thing is, you have to choose the thing that really interests you. Why did never ever anybody did a whole record with the warp mode? The warp mode is a fucked up situation if you really increase more than two or three percent, but it's a mistake, it sounds fantastic actually. If you really, have 100 BPM and you crank it up to 150 or go down, it, it starts making its own sound. And I'm really surprised that in the whole time that Ableton is used and existing, nobody ever did a full record with the warp mode extremely used, so it makes the own sound creation. I mean, I, I'm not interested in doing it, so I can tell it. <laughs> so, so I really would like, in one year, I would like to hear one record that is made with a warp mode extremely heavily used, because test it. It sounds not that bad. Everything you're talking about is, is basically you and the fact that, you know, you're making music, which is essentially your, I guess, your signature. You know, a lot of producers out there actually don't care about that. They care about the fact that they want to play at Berkheim or at Fabric in London. They want to create bangers. That's what it's about. Bangers. Bangers. <laughs> what is your take on producers who are just interested in creating bangers? About what? Bangers. <laughs> <laughs> let, me, let, me, <laughs> let me explain myself. Um, I think it's, you touched on something quite interesting. And just by listening to you, I get the idea that, you know, sound, audio production, is a craft of yours, is art for a lot of us. And even though, yes, we have to, uh, you know, we have to think about revenue streams, for you it's about pursuing sound and pursuing your idea of sound and sharing it with your audience. So particularly in the last five years, in this time, you know, from actually the time that you're talking about where you got bored, there's been a lot of emphasis on DJs and producers actually, well, producers focusing on the fact that making music is a career move and the fact that it's about making music that's for the dance floor to get me my Facebook likes and my social, you know, my Twitter followers so I can play big gigs, big festivals. So it's a different way of thinking. So what is your take on producers who focus mostly on music being an objective to a stardom as opposed to it being a craft? I mean, I, I, I will be careful, but judging on producers that take this step, actually, because I am part of it, actually. In what respect? Basically, I changed my set, or parts of my set, into more full to the floor one as well. Not, not to get booked in fabric or whatever, because I was playing there beforehand anyway. We closed Downscape about two years ago, and one, one of the reasons were, was definitely that too many producers that we worked with or 
we wanted to work with, they changed their, they changed their un unique way of producing into more, let's say, commercial way, exactly that they w get booked into fabric or other places. And I lost interest in this production immediately because I think the biggest mistake a producer can do, me included, is just because the amount of bookings that you get per year is going down, it doesn't increase that by changing the sound into a four to the floor idea. Because we have to live with the fact that if we design something very specific and unique sound, there is a time where it fits in and there's another time where it doesn't fit in to be played outside. So it's a wave anyway. And if we just change and use the same sounds and put a four to the floor kick drum under it, it doesn't really help for getting more shows. I can tell you, really. And these two signature sounds that you've talked about, these I've realized that from last year, you kind of consolidated all your recordings, all your back catalog is going to be available from your website. And that's going to be the um, portal for all your music. That's the idea. I, I need this to open the pole label as well, to squeeze everything into one platform and concentrate it to the idea of what my work is about. It's kind of like a gallery for myself that I designed, just to be able to focus on my work. Okay, Stefan, thank you Tony. very much indeed. Thank you, Tony. <laughs> thank you. And thanks, Benny and Dirk, wherever they are. Hello. So, Stefan.